So Psalm 1. Um, all right, I'm excited. So um, next week we're starting, we're kicking off our year next week officially with our first sermon series. We're doing a four-part series on Ruth, which is a fantastic Bible book. It's a, it's a very short novella. It's kind of a love story. It has some really big... Um, Really big implications of the, in, in its background, but we'll, we'll look at that next week. For this week, I kind of want to start where we started last week, the first um, last year. The first sermon we preached last year was actually, it's, it's the same text. It's Psalm 1. We're looking at the Word of God. Um, the, our sermon title is called Planted Trees and Shallow Chaff. Uh, we're looking at Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. If you're able to stand, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Um, David is writing, it's an introduction to this holy hymn book, and he says the following, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. Now the wicked are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Uh, you may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much for your word, Lord, and the fact that we have it. I love how the psalmist says, I, I know, I'm happy because I know what you expect from me because I have your word. And Lord, as believers, we follow you. And what we have is, as, as your son says, Jesus says, a firm foundation. Lord, we thank you so much for the word of God, for, for shaping our church by your word, for shaping our lives by your word, and revealing ourselves to you by your word. I pray right now that you bless us with this sermon that's well-trod ground, but it's well-trod for a reason. Thank you, and I love you. In your name I pray, amen. All right, so the main idea of the sermon, we're just going to be up front with this. It's, it's what we're, God willing, going to be talking about every January. It's simply this, uh, we must cling to the Word of God. And what we mean by that is, as Christians, I believe we get our health, our spiritual health, our emotional health from God's Word. Um, back in the 14 to 1500s and 1600s, there is a, literally a world-changing movement uh, that happened over in Central Europe called the Reformation. We know about the Reformation. A lot of us have T-shirts based on the Reformations talking about the five solas. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a shirt that's too small for me now, um, but Deb wears it, and it has a picture of Martin Luther, and it says, Viva la Reformation, right? And it's, it's, like a, it's a fun shirt, and I like it. And um, the really big thing they were trying to do back in the 14, 15, and 1600s, they weren't trying to leave the Holy Catholic Church. They were trying to reform it. And one of the big things that Martin Luther and John Calvin and Malchadon, one big ought that they had with religion being done at the day is that, you know, the church, Christians at the time, would get their perception of holiness, what God expects from their local priest, which is fine, or their local parish, or their local, um, their local saint, because they had saints, well, we're all saints, their local fill-in-the-blank at the time, and what had happened was these individuals, where they were getting the idea of holiness from was anybody's guess. Um, There's a man, Johann Tetzel, he was the guy who came up with the idea of indulgences, he did that um, to pay for um, extravagant building projects in Rome, so he would say, if you'd like your grandmother to be in purgatory less, then give us two dollars and we'll pray for you and she'll be in purgatory a hundred years less, right? And these people would give their lives, so much of their lives, so much of their energy, so much of their finances to... Fill in the blank. Anything but what God really calls his children to do. So as the Reformation would start, there is this famous thing that came up, one of the five solas. It's the idea of sola scriptura. It's this threefold idea that scripture has supreme authority over the church. All right? So as Park Heights Baptist Church, or even as Larry Bogan, a Christian, the Bible has supreme authority over me. Secondly, the Bible itself is clear for the church. Now, there is some stuff that's complicated in the Bible. We're not going to argue that. But, you know, you can get a pretty basic understanding of what the Scripture teaches just by listening to it. And then thirdly and finally is that the Bible itself is sufficient for the church. It's enough, right? 
You take that idea and you bring it down, and it means the Bible has authority over me, Larry Bogan. It's enough for me, Larry Bogan. And it's clear for me, Larry Bogan. And that's true for everybody in this room if you're a believer. In fact, William Tyndale, um, who was one of the first Bible translators, uh, he said, listen, the Bible is enough for, excuse me, the smartest king or the most ignorant plowboy. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. That's what we're pushing is just as we start the year, we're doing New Year's resolutions or we're pretending to at least. I really want to encourage you to spend time in your Bible, um, particularly the Old Testament. Um, What we're going to see in this psalm is three things. We're going to see the Word of God. It does three things for us today. One, it keeps us from ungodly influences. We're going to be needing this, as every year, we're going to be needing this. Secondly, the Word of God gives us stability. And then thirdly and finally, the Word of God makes us holy. It's our pathway to holiness, all right? So let's go ahead and get into it. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, the the Word of God, it keeps us from ungodly influences. Um, The Psalms is this really interesting thing because it's the first, it's not the first, but it's one of the oldest corporate hymn books we've had. Who here is old enough to know what hymn books are? Oh, man, ever. Okay, let's try it again. Who here knows what hymn books are? Okay, all right. So hymn books, they're like, if you, if you go to an older Baptist church or just any church that doesn't have screens, most, um, most churches, they've been doing this for a couple hundred years, they have a book, it's about four or 500 pages, it's got about four or 500 in songs. And what you would do is they would have the little musical ledger lines up there and people would say that they could sing harmony. They couldn't, that's just nostalgia. But you would read the lyrics and you would sing the songs and that was it, right? And that's what we did before we had PowerPoint. Psalms was the first, to borrow a phrase from the kids, the OG hymn book, right? So back in the Old Testament, you'd have these 151 hymns and songs and prayers. And when you'd have church back in the day, people would sing them. One of the, something that's really cool, we looked at this back in the spring, I think, and I think we're going to pick this up again this year, is not only would they sing the psalms, but they would also pray the psalms. So you have these psalms, such as Psalm 88, that's inspired by God, and it's David saying, God, you're not here, where are you? And there's no resolution, right? And they would sing that corporately together. And it's this wonderful thing. So, man, if you're looking at a place to start reading the Psalms, a psalm a day keeps the sad thoughts away. That's not true because there's plenty of sad thoughts in Psalms, but a psalm a day is really good. And what happens is Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, that's kind of the introduction. It's the intro. You guys, when you read books, do you read the intros? I skip them half the time. I shouldn't. They're really good. It sets the stage. And the stage that's set by the psalmist, presumably David, is twofold. One, the supremacy of the word of God, right? So before any worship takes place, it grows out of God's word. And then secondly is the supremacy of the Messiah, which is Jesus. But we'll get into that in a couple weeks. So what happens is it starts out. We see this, blessed is the man. And there's this phrase, the phrase, the word blessed there, it actually just literally means happy. And I think happy is something we're all striving for. It's good to be happy. Happy isn't the be all end all, but it's certainly nice to have. And what's interesting is in Hebrew, they repeat the word twice. So it says, happy, happy is the man, right? That's, if you ever watched Duck Dynasty back in the day, the happy, happy, happy guy, that's where he got it, right? Um, Probably not. But the idea is that, when he's painting this foundation of a full life, the psalmist, he's talking about happiness, not that you have to you know, paint on a cloud face all the time and pretend to be happy. It's talking about joyfulness and happiness just as your foundation. Or think of if you're looking at a beautiful painting, the background, right? It's the world in which we live. And you know what's interesting is I'm learning a lot about um, just about people who aren't Christians over at Marx. And the phrase I hear a lot, the refrain is, well, as long as they're happy, right? And you know, I would go back and say, you know, I think happiness is a good thing to strive for. And I think ultimately the psalmist will say our ultimate happiness, our, our ultimate joyfulness is found in Jesus, but it's found through the word of God to Jesus. And what the psalmist does is he, he states it two ways. He states it in a negative and a positive. He says, happy or happy, happy, he's the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer. And I love this because what David's doing is he's presenting this twofold progression. First, we see this idea of standing and then walking and then sitting. You know, And the idea of standing, you can stand next to somebody in a bus stop. You know, you guys ever been standing next to somebody in line and they start talking to you? And whether you like it or not, you're going to be hearing their influence, right? And then the idea of walking, it's the idea of striving together. You know, it's the idea of just walking down the hallway with somebody. You know, uh, you know I got some kids. 
Um, one of them's eight. Eventually, he'll walk to school, and he'll walk to school with his friends. And the more, eventually, when he does this, he walks to school with his friends, the more influence his friends will have over him, and the less will have over them. And I've been trying to figure out how not to go to work between eight and nine so I could walk with Jude and his friends. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's helicopter parenting. And then finally is the idea of sitting. And in Hebrew, what he's talking about there is not just sitting, it's reclining, it's resting. It's if you've ever been over to my house and you come and you go downstairs and, you know, you go down the stairs and you hopefully not fall down the stairs because they're very sharp stairs and you sit down and we usually have a pot of coffee out and a handful of semi-stained white mugs. And we'll usually have popcorn at it in the afternoon or lunch or whatever, right? That's what it means by sitting. It's spending time with, right? So you have this continued level of familiarity. And then you go back, and the parallel to that, it says sinner scoffer. Pardon me, it says wicked sinner scoffers. There's this continued kind of ratcheting up of the, the moral decline that comes from walking away from God. You know, the idea of the wicked, it's the idea of placing yourself on top of somebody else or before somebody else, right? You know, the idea of throwing the kid out of the lifeboat to get in the lifeboat if you're a full-grown man, you know, that kind of thing, right? And then we get into the idea of scoffers, and it's the people who, well, they scoff, they make fun of. And, you know, every time I think of that, I, every time I write out of Psalm 1, when I look at scoffers, pardon me, um, when I look at sinners I, I, and scoffers, I think of our current entertainment landscape. And, you know, the idea is the people who seem to do the best in the entertainment world today are the ones who are really good at wielding a hammer and just breaking things down, you know. And, you know, I remember I was growing up, and the show that I used to watch whenever I went over to my, my grandmother's house because she had cable was The Daily Show with, with Jon Stewart, right? And, you know, I'm not preaching against Jon Stewart, but, you know, Jon Stewart, his big thing was, man, here's everything that's wrong with the United States government, you know, just right? And, you know, I think he has a podcast or a show now called What's Wrong with Jon Stewart? And, you know, i got to tell you, I think if we have our lives just built on breaking things down, I think we're just left with rubble. And it's really hard to build with rubble. And I think that's David's point here. He goes, listen, if you want to be happy, you're going to just by nature get less at mad things on the internet. You're going to want to break things down less on the internet. Why? Because of what we're happy about. You know, I love this phrase, this, this turn of phrase here. He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law does he meditate day and night. That word, law of the Lord, that, he's, he's using the word Torah there. That's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, and Deuteronomy. That's the one thing that they always had in print. You know, a lot of the prophets were, you know, they'd write it down or they'd keep it by oral tradition. But if you went to your local synagogue back in the day, you would have a copy of the Torah. and You could have the priest read it to you. Or if you were very privileged, you could read it for yourself. And the idea is rather than delighting in the breaking down, rather than delighting in sin, rather than delighting in put your, putting yourself first, you delight in what? In God's word. And there's these, he uses two words, and they're both very important. He talks about delighting and meditating. You know, delighting is to look forward to, right? I, um, there's a YouTube channel. Um, I, I like my video games. And there's a YouTube channel where the creator always puts out his favorite video games for the year. And every morning and afternoon and evening this week, it's supposed to come out this week, I've been looking forward to it. I've been delighting in it, and I'll hit refresh on my YouTube feed. And he's still not there, and it's frustrating. And this week, he put out a YouTube video that had nothing to do with it, and I got mad, right? We all have stuff like that. You got your shows you look forward to. You, look, you got your albums you're looking forward to dropping. You got your friends that you're looking forward to seeing. And what David's saying here is, listen, if you're going to be happy, happy, if happiness and fullness is going to be your foundation, if it's going to be your background, the thing you're going to delight in is the Word of God. Now, here's what's really cool. We've all heard that commandment somewhere. You've got to look forward to the Word of God. And you're like, yeah, but like, TV is just more entertaining, or sleep is more restful, or I like hanging out with my friends more, or whatever. Here's the other one. It says, and on his law, he meditates day and night. That word law literally just means rumbling or grumbling, right? You guys ever do that thing? where um, you're doing something that's mindless, whatever it is, and your mind just kind of wanders, right? You know, I, whether it's driving. I know for me the big thing is I, I love working in produce because I can just throw my potatoes and think about whatever. i got to be careful because i got to stack them better than I do. But what happens is that idea of meditating, it's where your mind goes to 
when you're kind of on autopilot. You know, when the podcast is kind of boring and you got all of I-71 in front of you and it's an hour and a half to Columbus or whatever, right? You know, or, or whatever it is. It's wherever your mind goes. And what happens is when you start interacting with the Bible, and this, is, this was my, the big thing that I learned over the past couple of years as a Christian, when you start interacting with the Bible, what happens is naturally when you're not in the Bible, it kind of rattles around in there. And what happens is eventually... And this is a learned discipline, to be sure, and we'll get into this a lot in the next point. Eventually, you start delighting in it, and you start looking forward to it. Now, this is is the really important thing, right? What happens is in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, David has a very clear picture of what wickedness is, and he has a very clear picture of what joy in the Lord is. And the thing that distinguishes between the two is the Word of God. Here's where I'm fearful we run into a lot. A lot of times, we'll unintentionally look at the wicked or the sinners or the scoffers, and we'll assume that what they're saying is the Word of God, and we get our value from that instead. Let me give an example from church history. Um, Let me see if I can find it real quick. There is this um, queen. Yep, there we go. There's this queen named Elizabeth of Hungary back in the 1100s. And she loved Jesus. She absolutely adored Jesus. She was a Christian, had her prayer time, went to church, did the sacraments. Um, This was before we called them what Baptists call them, which is what I always forget. Um, Ordinances, right? You know, she did everything. And because she's a woman of means and she was a queen, she was able to hire a man named, let me see if I can find his name here, named Conrad Van Marburg to disciple her. Right Now, what Conrad did was he came in and he said, hey, listen, I know you really want to get close to Jesus. And she goes, yep. And he goes, in order to do that, you need to be eating less, and you need to see your family less, and you need to be whipped regularly. This is like a real thing in church history, by the way, right? And she's like, really? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. And I would know because I'm a priest. And she goes, okay. So what happened was her diet sustained to something of less than a servant's diet. She became really emaciated. And, you know, she would routinely endure beatings from this man. And, you know, she would be, you know, not trapped, but, you know, set away in a closet or set away and live as a homeless person for a while. And this whole time, Elizabeth is thinking she's getting closer and closer to God because Conrad, surely he's the path to godliness here. And what's sad, what's tragic is eventually she dies. You know, and we don't know why. Um, you know, it could be a lack of substance. It could, be, it could be physical abuse. It could be, you know, weathering the elements, you know, under an 80-pound frame as an emaciated young woman, right? But eventually she dies. Now, here's what's really sad for, for Elizabeth of Hungary. She becomes a saint. She's considered a saint by the, the Holy Roman Catholic Church for what she endured. What happens to Conrad? Conrad gets a promotion, and he becomes an inquisitor. Right? And Conrad Van Marburg becomes the head of what's known as the Spanish Inquisition. Right? So the Spanish Inquisition is, this, is based very, very closely on what Conrad did with Elizabeth. He would go around and say, well, are you spending too much time with your family? Are you believing heresy? Are you doing anything on the Sabbath? And what happened was there's this whole movement, pre-Reformation, where people thought they were being more holy, but honestly, they were being tortured and put to, de- push, put to death in the name of God, but not based on the word of God. This is a really important thing. You're like, Larry, this is a really dark way to kick off 2024, kind of. I think we're naturally inclined to listen, pe- listen to people that we like, whether they sound like us or they're funny or what have you. But the problem is, unless we're getting our ethics from the word of God and nothing else, we're going to drift. And we're going to find ourselves in really not safe waters as Christians that affect all areas of our life. You say, Larry, man, that was like 1,200 years ago. People don't change over 1,200 years. People are people, whether it's the 70s, 2024, or the 1500s. You know, the reason we cling so hard to the word of God is because we don't want to find ourselves either throwing somebody under the bus like Marburg did or being thrown under the bus like Elizabeth was thinking that we're pleasing God. So it's the word of God, not your pastor, but God willing the word of God preached through your pastor. That separates us from ungodly thought. Secondly, we see the word of God gives us stability, verses 3 or 4. So 
David continues, and he gives this, um, this well-known picture. He says he's like a tree planted by streams of water. Um, and we're going to stop there. What's really neat is, you know, I've learned this being a gardener. Did you guys know that plants need water to be alive? <laughs> I know, like, you're laughing. I had no idea. Man, um, in seminary, I had a good friend of mine who um, he bought some squash, and he just, like, stuck it in the ground, and it died. And he's like, why? It's in the ground. I'm like, I don't know. Like, 10 years later, water. Right, um, but the the way it works is that you know the idea of trees there. Um, David may have been referring to these ancient gardens, and the way they would do it is they would build they would build they would plant these trees intentionally near these big streams. And what these trees would do is they'd get these really big roots going, you know, 10, 15 feet deep, and those roots would keep the soil, keep the water, and keep the nutrients within the soil. And then around the trees, the other plants, you know, whether, whether they're smaller bushes or berry bushes or flowers, would be able to benefit from that soil and that moisture from that tree, right? And ultimately, the tree, it's living, it's surviving because it's sucking up all this water and this moisture and this nutrients from the river, but really, it's where it's planted. You know, we want to be river adjacent as trees. Well, what's the water? Man, the water's the word of God. And then it goes on, and we see how good it goes for this tree. It says, um, the tree is planted by streams of water. And I love it because of how personal this is. Back in the day, we're, we take the idea of being individuals for granted, right? You know, I'm, you know, I'm Larry Bogan, the individuals. You know, back in the day, back in the Old Testament, back in the, 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 the Near Eastern times, it wasn't who you are as an individual, but what you were a part of as your clan, as your family, as your tribe, as your nationality. And what David is doing here is he's doing something that's really foreign to the reader, but it fits with us. He gets personal. He gets individual. He says that one tree, not the entire garden, not the entire forest, that one tree, it yields its fruit in its season. He's focusing on that individual. Now, we don't know what that fruit is, and that's on purpose. Why? Because we're all gifted differently, and the Lord blesses us differently. You know, we are just as Christians as Abram Creek Baptist Church down down the road or Unity Free Will Baptist around the corner. God blesses us differently, and that's fine, and that's good. And I love it because it says it blesses, pardon me, the tree is blessed when? In its own season, you know what I love? I learned, I've learned this with kids is that I can't judge my kids based on how the next door neighbor's kids are doing, partially because my next door neighbors don't have kids, but also because if I play the comparison game, I'm going to be up all night angry or mad or prideful. You know, here, here's the thing about your own personal life. God has a plan for you, and it's not his plan for me. And how he works that out in your life is good, albeit different than anybody else in the world. And the way you get there isn't comparing yourself to the guy next to you or your roommate or your spouse or the family down the road. The way you get there, the way you find happiness is in joy is through the word of God because that's what gives us our nourishment. It also talks about how his his leaf does not wither and everything he does, he prospers. You know, I love this because, you know, when, when, by, when, when David's writing here, he's talking about a prosperous life, and we say, yeah, we want a prosperous life, and we go to the New Testament, and we got to look what that actually means. What does it mean to be prosperous as a, as a Christian in 2024? I would say it's being faithful to God's word. You're like, all right, so we're going to get huge piles of money. I mean, hopefully, that'd be great. But if we don't, that's not what God's talking about. You know, what God promises us ultimately for happiness and blessedness is himself, not something as small as money. Because not only does money come, but money also goes. Not only does money bring out the best of us when we're working with it, but man, it certainly can bring out the worst of us when we're trying to keep it. You could say the same thing about a, about a family name or a legacy or a country or a party or a band or anything. What happens is when we fall into the word of God and we are planted by the water of life, which, are, which is the words of Jesus Christ, what happens is we are given the best thing out there and it's God's presence himself. And everything we do, we prosper. What does prospering look like? Man, it's looking more like Jesus. Now here's the big, here's the big turn, right? Je- Jesus, David, he's not speaking in hyperbole, but he picks this other plan on purpose. He says the wicked, those three up top, or really you could say wicked is anybody outside of submitting to the word of God. 
The wicked are not so, but I love this, but they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. So chaff isn't necessarily a plant, but rather the husk or the hollow of a plant. So the way it goes is, is you'd grow wheat, and then you'd take the wheat stalks out, and what's left is the chaff. And the chaff was so hollow and so light that the way you'd winnow back in the day is you'd just get a pitchfork, and you'd throw the wheat and the chaff in the air, and the soft wind would blow it away. Okay? Now that's the first part. We're like, all right, we're not talking about stability. Or pardon me. All right, so you get blown away. I think it's more than just that, right? Um, there's a second reason why I tried to move everybody up front. This was a bad idea because our, our camera's not that, or our, our thing isn't all that great, but we're going to try it. Can you put that picture up there, Christian? Okay, all right. We're going to talk about the Dust Bowl. Who here knows about the Dust Bowl? Okay, enough people for this to work. All right, so what we have here is we have a gentleman who grew out these things called prairie grass, all right? Now, prairie grass was, in the early 1900s, very common over in northwest Texas and, uh, and Oklahoma, right? And then next to it, you have wheat, okay? Now, what you'll see is that the prairie grass isn't that impressive, except for when you go underneath, you can see that red box, right? That's its root system. The guy is holding up a piece of, of prairie grass, and if you look, that thing that looks kind of like a carrot, that's the root, okay? I know. You go over, and what happens is it has the word agriculture. You have wheat, and it's like maybe six inches deep, and that's it. Now, you go back, and what happened was way back in the day, in the 1920s or so, they were trying to expand because we're so smart as modern man. We know so much more than the Native Americans. We need to expand our farming. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, and we're going to till up all that prairie grass, they said, back in the 1920s, and we're going to get rid of it because it's a waste of space, and instead we're going to plant crops, specifically corn. Pardon me, specifically corn and wheat right? And what happened was everything went good for a couple of years. But what happened was all that root system right there, it was keeping what? It was keeping the soil. It kept nutrients. It kept water. Over in that part of the country, that part of Texas, that part of Oklahoma, they get about 15 to 20 inches of water a year, and that's it. The reason the prairie grass could survive and thrive, even though it doesn't look like it's thriving, is why? Because of that, that root system, that really complicated root system. So what happens is they, they literally rip it all out, and they plant this thing. And the first, for the first couple of years, it goes really well. You know, the farmers, they're making their money back and all that stuff. But then something happened, a 10-year drought. And what happened was, there, Ken Burns does this fantastic five-part documentary on it. I think it came out in 2012 called The Dust Bowl. If you get a chance, if you got time, check it out. But what happened was, because the root system wasn't there, there is no moisture, there is no nutrients that kept in the soil. What happened was 106, no, 1 1.6 million acres lost all of their topsoil. And you can see these pictures of the soil getting blown away down from the bottom Midwest, you know, a little bit north of Texas, and you could see it in Washington, D.C. And what happened was it literally took us about 15, 20 years to recover from that. Why? Because the root system was gone, okay? Uh, this is really big, because a lot of times when we talk about stability, we talk about staying on, a, you know, staying on the stage or staying on a boat. I think a better way to think about stability is that root system. You know, we're, we're in this really weird place in culture where so much of our traditions as Americans have been done away with or, or are under attack for right and for wrong. And we're not going to comment on that directly, but what we're accidentally doing as individuals is we're removing that root system. Now, do some things need to be done away with? Yeah, I think so. I absolutely think so. I think that makes sense because we're all sinful. Sure. But what happens is where we're landing right now is we're the plants on the right. And we have no root. And I think... If we're not there, we're going to be there soon. We're going to be in this time of really a social and a cultural dust bowl. And it's in the air we breathe. It's in all parts of the world, or it's in all parts of the United States. So how do we navigate that as Christians? I mean, how do we deal with that? You know, if it's on our YouTube playlist, if it's on the radio, if it's on our, you know, our XM radio ads, if it's on everything, if everything's going up on fire, how do we survive the harsh winds of the world around us? I would answer, we set down roots. Well, what roots? The Word of God. 
You know, this is a really important thing, and I'm learning this as I'm getting older. This year I'm turning 40. I've been reading the Bible for since I was 13, so more than five years. And um, I have a stabler life now than I did when I was 13. And my life should be less stable because I have three kids that go everywhere, right? And what's been happening over the past however many years is like that guy holding that, that prairie grass, my roots have been getting deeper. You know, you ever, our younger Christians, you ever look at somebody who's older and you see them weather a very severe death in their family or a very big tragedy and they seem to be doing not great but okay and you're like, how on earth are they doing that? Because they've been rooted in the word of God. To our people who are my age and down, I want to, get, I want to encourage you to read the Bible. Why? Because I'm going to have overnight success and feel great? No, but you're building towards it. You know, I, I got to tell you, it's, um, oh man, I, I remember last year about this time, we were in a really tough spot as a church, right? And I, I preached the sermon, and the last thing I said here is that if, in my point, is in my notes, uh, what does it say? I want our church to be grounded in the word so when the winds of change comes, we aren't swayed. That was last year. We're in 2024, and I have in red and in parentheses, holy cow, that was 2023 for us, and we weren't swayed. Why? I think it's because our congregation, Park Heights Baptist Church, because we're rooted ourselves to the word of God. We've seen some really cool and a little bit unsettling stuff, you know, blow throughout Brook Park, Middleburg Heights, Parma, and Berea over the past year. Like, y'all, like, marijuana's legal, right? <laughs> like, that's weird for me. We're not swayed. Why? Because we have the Word of God, right? The reason we re- read the Word of God, even though TV's more fun or Instagram's easier to, you know, to, to scroll through or sleep is better and sweeter is because that's the thing that gives us the route to navigate our lives. So not only does it keep us from being ungodly, right? And not only does it provide stability in our lives, thirdly and finally, the word of God makes us holy. This is really important. So we get there and, you know, he starts with blesses the man, happy, happy. Then he talks about the tree, the planted tree versus the uprooted chaff. Then we get to the end, and he says this, Therefore the wicked, they shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the, of the righteous. So what David's doing here is he's setting his sights for the judgment of God. You know, the Bible teaches how one day we will all stand before God. I'm a Christian. I will not be judged based on my merit, but man, I'm going to have to give an account of my life to Jesus. We all are. And what's really important here is we're talking about this, and what David's saying is, listen, if you're happy, happy, Verse 1, if you're planted in the word of God, you know, verse 3, you're going to be able to stand before the Lord. Why? Because it's taken root in your heart, and it's taken root in your life, and it'll bear good fruit. It is really important. We, we looked at this a couple months ago in Galatians chapter 6. Paul writes this as a warning. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that will he reap. For the one who sows in the flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. The one who sows in the spirit will reap of the spirit eternal life. You know, Paul here in the New Testament is echoing what David's pointing at here. You don't want to be humiliated when you're standing before God. Man, the wicked will be. Why? Because they've skirted God's instructions, because they've skirted God's love letter to them. And then he continues on, he says, listen, you know, not only will wicked not stand in in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You know what I love about this is what the psalmist is talking about here is good corporate fellowship, right? Whether it's the new heaven and new earth when we get there down the line or coming to church on Sunday. You know, and let me explain. There's this Psalm 24, and let me read this, talking about church life in the Old Testament. He says, um, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Talking about going to the temple in Jerusalem on the mountain. Who shall go to his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. You know, what happens is when when the word of God takes root, we find our joy in it. What kind of happens naturally and organically is the thing that we try and do anyways, which is making our lives better, making ourselves more ethical or more holy or better people. You know, the reason we're able to do that is because the word of God dwells in us richly and the Holy Spirit draws on us to ch- on that to change our hearts. Now, this is kind of a tricky thing because we continue on. You're like, wait a minute, Larry, we're Baptists, we're Christians. I thought we weren't Catholic. I thought we were saved by grace. 
Jesus is the one who saves us. So suddenly you're saying you need to do good, to do good in church. So what do you mean by that, right? Uh, Let's talk about this for a second, right? What's really important is that no matter how good I do, I'm never going to be better than that Conrad guy. And I'm not. So you're like, Larry, you're going to go start another inquisition? No, not necessarily, but heart condition, it's kind of the same. You know, let's not forget one of the most wicked men of the 20th century was an art school reject, right? Okay, enough people are nodding to know what I'm talking about. Good, all right. You know, that's a real thing. We all have that inside of us. So how with our wicked hearts do we get better just by reading the Bible? I mean, Conrad knew the Bible, but he warped it to abuse women and torture people. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here, here's, what, here's what Paul says about this. He says, listen, all this from God through Jesus Christ, he reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. So what does that mean? We're always going to be crossed ways with a holy God as sinful people because that's exactly what we are. We can't escape that. We can't escape our sinfulness because we got it from our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents all the way back to Adam. So how do we escape it? Well, we can't. Jesus does, right? What I love is that the creator comes and reconciles, purchases back those who left his side, who were sold to slavery through sin. Yep, that's right. And he does so because of how great we are? No, because of how much he loves us. And here's what I love about the Bible. In religion, you're not going to get that unless you go to the Bible to get that. And this is important because I want to do better as a pastor, as a husband, as a dad, and as an individual. I do. And so oftentimes it seems that I fail, which I do, right? So where do I get hope from that? How do I not just drown in what some people call imposter syndrome? Everyone thinks you're great, but you know you're awful, right? Well, we give it to Jesus. I'm reading this really good book called Life Together by Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And at the beginning, he talks about the best community you can have is a Christian community, right? And the idea was he was writing this in Nazi Germany where the type of Christianity he was running, Orthodox Christianity, had been swapped out for nationalistic Christianity that really pushed after the Third Reich. And Diedrich was lonely, right? I mean lonely, because it went from praise God to Heil the Fuhrer, you know, in church. And eventually Diedrich, he, he gets on a boat and he's able to go back to the United States and he's so wounded for his German brethren back in the United States that he comes back over. And he writes this beautiful book, Life Together. And he says, listen, a lot of times as Christians, we think um, life together is best under an ideal, a, ho- a more holy church, a more better church, a more giving church, whatever, right? And he goes, no, because if you lean into that ideal, it's going to fall apart. Why? Because we can't make that ideal because we're sinful people, Right? So what's a good community? He goes, a good community is where Jesus is present, even when we're sinful, where Jesus is present, even when we fall short, where Jesus is present, even if the church or the Christian family or the Christian small group has warts. And by the way, we all got warts, right? Well, what makes it good? It's the word of God, right? You know, Bonhoeffer, and this is a fantastic, it'll be a difficult book to write and to read, his big thing, what he lands on, chapter and chapter, page and page, um, paragraph and paragraph, is reading the Word of God and praying the Word of God and singing the Word of God and sharing a meal over the Word of God because it's the Word of God that leads to real change. And I got to tell you something. I, what I love about our church is the fact that with the Word of God, which we have, whether in paperback or leather-bound, or pleather-bound, or on an app. We have everything we need to succeed as a church, as a family, and as an individual. What do we have? We have the Word of God. So, man, this year, as we get into the new year, spend some time in the Word of God. Something we're going to put out on the rundown um, tomorrow. I know, uh, since I picked up at Mark's, you guys have noticed the additional resources have gotten a little bit scanter. Um, we're going to be putting up a handful of reading plans. Uh, we're going to talk about how to get through the New Testament in a year. It's three chapters a week. Doable. How to get through the Old Testament in a year. It's five chapters a week. How to do the Bible in a year. It's like a three and a half chapters. Um, pick a plan. Find an accountability partner and do it. Why? Because you're laying down roots for the year. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you so much for this day. I thank you so much for letting us come together and worship you. I thank you so much for the fact that we know that you love us through your word. God, your word is authoritative in our lives. Your word is clear in our lives, and your word is enough. Thank you for the fact that my eight-year-old, my six-year-old, and my two-year-old can learn about you through your word. God, I thank you. I thank you for the fact that your word is sufficient for doctors and plowboys. I want to pray right now that you give us a hunger for your word. Give us a desire to meditate on your word. Please help us center our lives, our church, and our family on your word.